Walk like a man, talk like a man. As you can see, I'm not a man, uh, but I might know something about men, um, which we are representing in this very slide that is only here to show you that we know what we're talking about, basically. Um, please uh, welcome Rochus Wolf, who is a gender scholar and film critic and tons of other stuff. And next to him is uh, Ray Grimm. She is head of games pilot, so she knows about games. But you're all here to see if you're really, really manly. So let's get this over with. Um, and this is interactive, so everyone needs to stand up now. Mm. Once and for all, we will see if you're a manly man. And it's really easy. It's just six very easy questions. If you answer the question with no, you just have to sit down. So the first one is kind of obvious. Are you biologically male? Meaning, do you have XY chromosome, a penis, you know, the whole bits and pieces? Sorry, girls. Are you white? Or as the Americans like to say, are you Caucasian? Which also means no mixing pure European descendants. Are you heterosexual? No bisexuality, no, you know, maybes, flexibility. We're not flexible, okay? We're heterosexual, Kinsey scale, zero, boobs and boobs only. That's the whole deal. Are you healthy? Healthy meaning no hair loss, no glasses, no false teeth, no back problems, no hearing problems. Are you sexually active? Does it function? Can you make babies the whole bit? Are you a Christian or for, because this is, you know, Europe, are you at least uh, atheist or agnostic? And are you active? Active is a very nice euphemism for being either dominant, like the boss or the leader of any kind, um, or are you, at the very least, very athletic, uh, a sports person, a fighter, a soldier, whatever it is. <laughs> so, let's just look around how many... <laughs> yeah, that's like 5% maybe. Okay, everyone who's still standing, you don't need this talk. Like, you can just leave. You're really male, you could like give talks on how being male really helps and you know, give other people the chance to male up or something, but you don't need this. Um, but over to Rojos, he's going to explain those six questions. Thanks for playing along. Um, what we have just done is show you that among those of us who self-identify as men here in this room, only very few fulfill all the criteria for, of masculinity we have just listed. If we want to be perceived as manly in our society, we all have to position ourselves in relation to these characteristics. Which is to say, in our little game, we just reproduced and reenacted a very specific kind of exclusionary practice by explicitly making all of you decide, are you in? Or are you out? And quite possibly, some of you might have felt a bit humiliated when you had to sit down. All our six criteria are those that define themselves as not feminine. To be manly, you have to be decidedly non-female. Masculinity as a concept works by excluding, among others, women and their perceived characteristics. And boy, does it suck if they don't care? This gender binary, I'm simplifying here a bit, is exclusionary and hierarchical, putting men above women. But there is also a hierarchy within the possible concepts of masculinity. That is why being, for example, non-muscular, homosexual or non-dominating will get you called a sissy, a pussy, or you're such a girl. That, very specifically, is the way the most desirable form of masculinity is usually constructed in our culture, in our society, by valuing one form of masculinity over the other, and by positioning the lesser form in direct connection to something that is considered even less desirable. 
and in many cases that is women, or rather, the concept of femininity. We will call this form of masculinity, embodied by the hypothetical supermanly man of utter manliness, and deemed most desirable in our society, we will call it hegemonic masculinity. This is, of course, not a concept we came up with ourselves. That was done by people a lot smarter than we are, and the term has been used since the 1980s. It's neither the most recent nor the most refined theoretical approach, but let us tinker with it for a while and see where it takes us. Hegemonic masculinity is a concept that comprises widespread ideals, fantasies, and desires about what it means to be a man in a very specific point in time and culture. So to make this very clear, what we are looking at here today are ideals of masculinity shared by many people from white, middle-class, Western European backgrounds. And as with wealth in a capitalist society, the whole concept only works if only very few people can embody or at least represent this form of masculinity at the top of the pyramid. So if you cannot, don't despair. That's the whole point of it. We will now be looking at three different kinds of masculinity that all they claim to being the most desirable one, and we will look at some examples of how they are shown in movies, video games, and popular culture, which means we will look at what imagery is used in representing these specific forms of masculinity. We will begin with a model of masculinity that is mostly described by its body, its appearance, its exterior, the so-called spornosexual. Our second example is the alpha male, defined by status and power, and then, as our third and final example, we will have to talk about nerds. And Rochus forgot the pussy. How can we get the pussy? So, the spornosexual is my favorite kind of man, I guess. The spornosexual, um, it's kind of like the new metrosexual while being simultaneously very traditionally masculine. Um, but let's start from the very beginning. As usual in the world of utter manliness, the beginning starts with um, Chuck Norris. At the end of the 70s and beginning of the 1980s, movies and body culture had an interesting reaction to the very devastating losses of the Vietnam War. If you remember, it was the very first war that was actually televised, so in the evenings everyone in the United States could see the latest happenings and the, what they saw was a lot of very young American men dying, being wounded, losing limbs and coming home completely devastated. So the old traditional masculinity, the kind of like John Wayne masculinity, got lost. So what do you do, especially if you're Ronald Reagan and you really need um, a very manly and strong America, you build a new man. And this man was distinctly different looking. He was wearing its strength and dominance basically on the outside. He was indestructible, he saved America on its own, um, and he was the so-called hard body, a guy that needed no army because he was the fucking army. Let me show you. There's no sound. So, I can lip sync it. Okay, um, wait, wait, wait. I will destroy you.
It's okay, it's okay. We have other things though that we need the sound for. We'll see. Well, by the late 1980s, America was very masculine again, so those huge muscle mountain bodybuilding guys were really not needed anymore, so either they vanished or they started doing comedy. I don't know if you remember those amazing films. Stop or my mom will shoot um, a highlight of Sylvester Stallone's career. Well, men's exteriors very slowly went from hard bodies to metrosexuality in the 90s, um, and then kind of fused around 2000 into what we now call the spornosexual. So what the fuck is a spornosexual? Spornosexuals are men who strive to look like sportsmen and or porn stars. Um, they are buff as hard bodies, they have a lot of muscles, but not as many, they are not really crazy bodybuilders, and they also have a perfect scientific muscle building routine with a perfectly well-adjusted diet uh, that uh, is combined with it, so it's basically like anorexic bodybuildings or something like this. Here are some amazing examples, I call this the Chris Collection. It's Chris Pratt, Chris Evans, Chris Hemsworth, <laughs> before and after. And uh, a little case study with my favorite Wolverine, body, hair, and muscles in perfect combination. Um, Jack, no, what's his name? Hugh Jackman. Hugh Jackman in 2000 and in 2013, X-Men, the first version, and then the Wolverine. For the latter, he trained for three months, about five to six hours. He had a very strict diet plan, which included so much chicken that he cannot eat chicken anymore because it makes him puke. Um, he didn't eat after 7 p.m. He had amazing nutrition supplements with hyper-masculine names like Animal Pump and Animal Nitro. Because, you know, uh, it, everything must be manly, I guess. Uh, and before actually shooting, he dehydrated himself, so he didn't drink any water, so his veins would pop out more, which obviously worked. Um, yeah, well, I'm just gonna go on. Uh, there's the sexual in Spornosexual, which is very interesting because the hard bodies of the 1980s defied sexuality in every single way. They were soldiers, they didn't have time to have sex. Uh, the spornosexual now is very different. He really likes to be looked at. He is a sex object. He likes to objectify himself and he is being objectified by others. Uh, <laughs> um, it's really interesting because actually this is borrowed from metrosexuality and from gay culture. Uh, and I have a very nice example which I kind of made myself uh, from James Bond, where you can see that it's really hard being a spornosexual and being really, really straight, but then being really sexual and sexualized at the same time, because that's kind of really gay. Oh yeah, I'm gonna give you the sound again. Ooh. Oh. Here's my little cut. Look at him doing the duck face. There. And this is when uh, Pierce Brosnan says, magnificent view. Magnificent view indeed, I guess. And as you can see, Pierce Brosnan is like the pre spornosexual while the guy coming out of the water, whose name I just forgot because I only look at his muscles, uh, is the absolute spornosexual. Thank you very much. Over to you. So let's look at our second form of desirable masculinity in popular culture, the alpha male. The word obviously comes from biological terminology and what we're looking at in the alpha male is a masculinity that is derived less from the body than more, more from the man's position, from his power over others and his choices and actions. So the alpha male in our culture, Western European, highly influenced by US popular culture, has its roots in the cowboy, the hero of the frontier, the natural leader whom women as well as other men look up to. 
As a consequence of this, the imagery surrounding the alpha male is tied back to traditions, traditional masculine roles and ideals. In contrast to the spornosexual, the alpha male is often depicted as slightly older. He may even be 40 plus, just like me, look at that. He might be overweight and balding. Let's look at some examples, and again, I'll probably have to uh, give you some sound, uh, although I don't know all the text, but one, at one point I know it. This is probably obvious. Take off your hat. Doesn't say anything else, and doesn't need. This I don't remember, I have to say. The alpha male is depicted here as active, he is dominating others, and he is a strategic thinker. He holds a position of power. It does not necessarily include physical violence. He might also be wealthy or be influential or all three. His power also includes responsibilities. So he's often depicted as the head of a company or of a family or both, as it were. And this picture so shows something that is often very important in the representation of the alpha male, how other men defer to him. While his body may not be as important in itself, his appearance definitely is. The alpha male will usually wear a suit and other wearable items that are coded as male, as for example these watches. He will drink fluids that are considered manly, either hard liquor or, more often, beer. It is, of course, not by chance that ads describe the alpha male mostly in terms of the things he owns. He uses, eats or drinks. These ads are literally selling you an ideal of masculinity. If you will, it's the commodities that make this man. Yet it is at the same time quite visible in the ads that his representation can be adapted, modernized if you will, to more modern standards and ideas or more modern products. And while the imagery surrounding the alpha male hasn't changed all that much, during the last decades, the nerd is quite a different animal. So, of course, you get the gamer to talk about nerds. Well, then let's talk about nerds. So, what is a nerd? Well, it depends on when you're asking that question. Because a few years ago, a gamer or a nerd was quite a different animal. Um, if you called someone a nerd, it was meant to be an insult, something to belittle other people to tell them they didn't quite fit the social norm. Per definition, a nerd was someone who was awkward or unattractive, socially impaired, maybe intelligent, but also obsessive, and also interested in non-mainstream activities, such as, well, science, video games, comics, and so on. As I said, a lot has changed since then. Because the way we look and define nerds today is quite different. What was once an insult is now kind of, well, a badge of honor. We call ourselves nerds if we are passionate about something, be it a video game, a comic, a movie, and so on. It doesn't really matter. We don't hide anymore. We step out there and we are passionate about what we love. But as it is with passion, it can go in different directions. One of it is, well, not quite as good, I would say, um, because it means we also have new kinds of culture wars. We fight about who gets to call themselves a nerd and who just tries to pretend. Because suddenly, being uncool is very cool. We have to thank the internet and the growing technologization of the world for that. Because what was once an obscure hobby is now part of everyday life. The more you know about technology, the more successful you are in the real world. You probably all know of that. Just ask people like, like Steve Wozniak or Mark Zuckerberg, who would have once dismissed as a nerd, but are now one, well, I'd say, even a new ideal to strive for. We've gone from this to this when talking about nerds. With that in mind, that's... 
With that in mind, it would be easy to say that gamers, nerds and geeks are outside of the toxic mas masculinity system, but unfortunately they aren't. Let's talk about a bit about gamers, because, well, I am one and it seems obvious, kind of. Um, the reasons gaming and nerds are so closely tied is because games give um, nerds the ability to hide from other people, maybe alpha guys or, well, maybe spawnosexuals, yeah, <laughs> looking at you, <laughs> hiding from you. They give the socially shunned a way to escape and even pretend to be someone else, maybe one of those guys. The interactivity of video games um, enables a deeper level of identification with heroes. In some cases, it's possible to create your own character, to be someone who always want to be. But in most cases, you are stuck with what the developers give you. And what they give you, well, it's what they grew up with, what they maybe themselves want, li want to be like. Some kind of ideal you can hardly achieve in real life. As such, video games give even the unmanliest of men the ability to be the pinnacle of mankind. Instead of helping to escape society's toxic concept of masculinity, video games not only embrace, but also reinforce it. Let's talk about the manliest of man games, GTA V. GTA is a Grand Theft Auto for those who are not nerds or gamers. Um, is one a hugely popular series of video games and um, especially the latest game in the series received a lot of criticism for its depiction, depiction of women, of men, of pretty much everything. But what stood out was that before the game was even released it got a lot of criticism because um, there were three, three playable male characters and well, as I just said, they were male characters, no women. No matter what you personally think about that, what was really interesting was what um, Grand Theft Auto, I don't know, father and Rockstar Games co-founder Dan Hauser said about it. He said, the concept of being masculine was so key to the story. Just, well, think about that for a bit. What makes GTA V so masculine? Is it the guns? The cars? The sex workers? playing golf? Well, the game doesn't really give an answer. And, well, neither can I. The only thing I can do is guess. And what I can guess is not really that flattering, neither to the game nor to, well, men, which is unfortunate. But thinking of the core mechanics of GTA, GTA 5 especially, it makes me wonder if Dan Hauser meant the violent behavior and the aggression the characters display. Because games like GTA V and so, so many others just play in the expectation that if you want to be a real man, you need to be aggressive. You need to be violent. Especially if your masculinity is threatened. As you have surely realized by now that threatening masculinity is a very easy thing to achieve because, well, if a woman likes it, it's not manly anymore. And that's, well, a big problem because if your masculinity is threatened that easily how do you react to threats like that most of the time you're lashing out so with that in mind neither things like gamergate nor the violent reactions to anita sarkisian's idea to make a video game seri a video series about the portrayal of women in video games is that much of a surprise so this is basically what happens if a woman tries to talk about video games. She gets harassed, she gets threatened. Just because some people receive even the idea of her talking about, well, manly man things as a threat. Instead of healthy discussions, we have violent threats against those who spoke out. Which is, if you think about, about it, almost ironic because a lot of people who started playing video games started to play them to stop the bullying, to escape the bullying, to escape the real world. And now they are doing exactly that to others. Because instead of escaping the different kinds of masculinity we've shown you, the nerd, 
more specifically the gamer, is actually a summary of all of them, at least in a spiritual sense. In real life, achieving the perfection of a spawn of sexual is not possible. In video games, as you can see, they're pretty much the default. They are impossible perfect and fit men who will recover even from gunshots in a matter of seconds and never get tired from gunning and running and climbing and having sex. <laughs> well, pretty much the same is the case with, the, with Alpha, because whatever triple-A game you play, you are always the biggest badass around. You will always be dominating others, either by sheer will or violence. So, well, video games make impossible forms of masculinity possible and reinforce those unhealthy stereotypes instead of, inside of those who consume them, instead of giving them uh, the ability to escape. So, what does all of this tell us? What does it mean for you? What does it mean for me? What does it mean for gamers? Well, basically, it means we are all fucked. Simple as that. We're not going to end on that note. As we tried to show at the beginning of our talk, society's standards for masculinity are too narrow for almost anyone to fit into. It's highly unlikely that you are the super manly man of utter manliness, or actually even close to the top of this pyramid. And if you think about what Hugh Jackman had to go through so that he would appear to be this manly just for a movie, the whole structure does not seem very healthy for anyone. So this kind of sucks, right? The big question is, what can we do about it? The bad news, there is no easy way out of this. You can't just decide and leave masculinity behind or the binary system of gender. Society won't just let you pack up and leave. But of course there are ways to make it less of a burden. Start off with realizing, for example, that neither watches, nor beer, nor anything you can buy will define you as a person or as a specific gender or sexual orientation. Next step, you might think about that being active, dominating or strong is not necessarily made quality and also it might not always be a good thing. Neither clothes nor characteristics are inherently male or female and the same is true for what you like and hate. Girls love video games, and boys love One Direction too. Of course, to understand that, and to conclude that male and female attributes not only have the same worth, that men are not better or worse than women, but that gender is not very helpful in categorizing people anyway, those are feminist ideas, and gosh, no, we wouldn't possibly want to bother you with these. Instead, let's rather look at a cute kitten instead. But what we wanted to to do is show you and get you thinking about the fact that movies, video games and ads convey and reinforce norms and ideas that are at their heart arbitrary and may in some cases not be good for you. Most of all, they can't tell you what it's like to be the man you already are. Thank you very much for your attention.